Captain Wendell Stevenson, uh, past president of Final Exit Network. Uh, I got an email in January, well, we got an email in January from a uh, fellow named uh, Harris, I believe, Mike Harris, uh, who is part of the uh, Libertarian Party Convention here. And uh, he was, he said something, well, let me quote him. Rather than uh, just trying to remember from, uh, let me see here, let me put it on the Let me quote him. Uh, Mr. Hayes is his name. He said, uh, Libertarians believe that you should be able to do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt someone else or their property or pose a substantial risk to it and take responsibility for their own actions. One of the foundational principles of libertarianism is the right of self-ownership, the right to decide when to end one's life. It's very well under the umbrella of our organization's philosophy. He went on to say that I think making it legal for a person to decide to be free of their pain as well as those they have chosen to assist them meshes quite well with our theme, legalized freedom, and the organization's philosophy. Uh, in that email, he didn't indicate what the Libertarian Party might be interested in from us, so we emailed them back, and I got, a, we got another email, this time from Betty Rose Ryan, who's the convention committee chair. Anybody know her? I don't know her. I hope to uh, meet her. Uh, she sent an email saying that she uh, would like to ask me to give a 50 minute seminar on the right to die issue. Uh, so here I am, ready to give the seminar. But giving a seminar is a misnomer, don't you think? <laughs> you don't give a seminar because a seminar is a discussion. It's a, convers it's a conversation. It's question and answer. It's a Socratic style um, undertaking, right? So you don't give a seminar. Uh, you enter into a discussion. You enter into a seminar. So that's what I propose to do, right? Uh, I'm not going to give a seminar. I'm not going to give a speech. I'm hoping that we can have a discussion. We aren't very large. Uh, I didn't expect very many folks. In fact, I'm surprised there's more than one. Um, <clears throat> I was contacted by a reporter before I arrived, and he asked me if he could talk to me about that libertarian view on the right to die. And I said, well, I'll certainly be willing to talk to you, but I do not represent the libertarians. I am a member of the Libertarian Party, but I don't represent the Libertarian uh, National Convention. I'm certainly happy to talk, talk to you. Um, so my background is in philosophy. Indeed, I'm a philosophy instructor at a college in Fresno, California, uh, Fresno City College. And we go in for discussions and conver conversations and questions and answers, right? And debates and all that good stuff. So that's what I'm hoping uh, that we can do today. Uh, I will try to start it. Uh, and uh, I will tell you a little bit about our name, Final Exit Network. Has anybody ever heard of us before you came here today? All right, that's what I expected. You have? Yeah, I don't much about it. You vaguely have heard of us. Yeah. Okay. So, a uh, bit of a puzzling name, I think. So, first question is, has anybody not heard of Derek Humphrey? Many people have not heard of Derek Humphrey. Okay, <clears throat> so he is actually very famous uh, in the Right to Die movement, for one thing, and he started it in the United States. I think I have a photo of him here. There he is. Uh, a bit longer than two now, uh, but uh, back about uh, 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Uh, he was a bit younger, and uh, he started what was called the Hemlock Society back in the 80s. I believe he started in Los Angeles initially, uh, but then soon, uh, for reasons unknown to me, he moved to Oregon, and that's where I first heard about it in the 80s in Oregon. Right. The Hemlock Society was devoted primarily uh, to changing the law, to getting a law introduced uh, that would make it legal <clears throat> for a person to receive assistance from a physician in ending their lives. When I say assistance from a physician, I mean uh, receiving a 
lethal dose of something. Um, lethal, an overdose of barbiturates, let's say, which as you all know, you cannot get as a private citizen. Uh, you have to have a prescription. And so the Hemlock Society is all about uh, trying to make it legal for doctors to prescribe an overdose of barbiturates so that if you wish to, uh, you can end your life in a relatively peaceful manner. Uh, it carried on until 2003, as you see there. And at the same time, sorry, uh, about 1998, uh, you had something, an arm of the Hemlock Society called Caring Friends that devoted itself to providing information to people uh, as to how to painlessly, peacefully, quickly end their lives when they were suffering from some sort of lethal, irremediable condition. For example, Parkinson's, or Alzheimer's, or ALS, like that. Uh, by the way, I didn't know Alzheimer's was a lethal condition until my dad came down with it a few years ago. Um, and then I saw on his death certificate that the cause of death was Alzheimer's. It is a lethal condition. One of those lethal conditions that slowly kills you, right? <clears throat> um, so Caring Friends, uh, created about 1998 uh, with the help of uh, Jerry and a few other folks, uh, devoted itself not to trying to change the law, but to working with folks who were suffering as it were right now. By that time, uh, Oregon had passed a law uh, legalizing a doctor's assisted suicide. Um, I believe it was around 1994 that they actually passed the law. Um, and then there was a challenge to it, and they had to go to the voters in 97, and the voters supported it. It's been legal in Oregon since that time. Right? We can talk about the Oregon law a bit later. Um, then, uh, slowly, uh, things began to change, and people weren't so happy with the Hemlock Society. Those of you familiar with ancient philosophy and Socrates know that allegedly Socrates died by taking an overdose of hemlock, right? Uh, that's the story that you get in Plato. Uh, that's a story that everybody knows. The fact is we don't actually know uh, what the poison was that uh, <coughs> Socrates took. And interestingly, when I went to Oregon uh, years ago, I lived there for a while, uh, hemlock trees were all over the place. The trees they called hemlock trees. Right? And one naturally assumed, oh, that must be the uh, <coughs> tree from which Socrates Uh, well, name change, right? 
So compassion choices comes into existence from the Hemlock Society because they didn't like the Hemlock thing, right? Compassion Choices uh, was the only organization for a while, a short while, but on the board of directors, there were people who thought that something like the Caring Friends Organization should continue. After all, they work with suffering people. They work with people who do not qualify for an Oregon-style law, who may not live in Oregon, first off, right? Uh, but even if they did, they don't qualify for any Oregon law. Uh, anybody familiar with the Oregon law? By chance? Okay. Uh, what's one of the requirements of the Oregon law that might mean that some people will not fall? You would have to have twice. You have to have approved once in six two weeks. Yeah. What's the condition that you have to be diagnosed with? What, what does the doctor have to say? Physical or you be broken back in pain. Okay. So. Uh, terminality is the crucial criteria, right? You have to be declared terminally ill by a doctor. What does terminally ill mean? Six months or less to live. In one sense of terminally ill, we're all terminally ill, right? Okay? But uh, in the Oregon style law, uh, you have to be declared by two doctors uh, to have less than six months to live. Now, most doctors will tell you that that really is an impossible standard to meet. Madison is not good enough, um, maybe never will be good enough, to say you only have six months to live. And by the way, opponents of working style laws like to use this as a case against working style laws. Right? Is that six months to live with or without medication treatment? <coughs> I think normally it's with treatment, right? So even with treatment, you have six months or less to live. Um, uh, opponents often say, yeah, well, my uh, sister was diagnosed with terminal, terminal condition, and here she is six years later doing just fine. Right? And there are many such stories like that. Um, <clears throat> and that's one reason why an organization like Caring Friends was created because there are many conditions that are lethal, they will kill you, but there is no way you can say that you'll be dead within six months. Right? Parkinson's is a classic case of that, as is Alzheimer's, as is ALS. How long has a famous physicist Hawking lived now with ALS? 35 years? I mean, 40 years? Or 50 years? I think he's my age. Uh, I'm 67. <clears throat> I think he was diagnosed with uh, ALS when he was like 27. I didn't see the movie. He was early 20s and now he's over 70. So, it's been yeah. so he's a little older than me. So that just shows you there. ALS is, is a lethal condition, right? Not to mention highly debilitating, right? Uh, but <laughs> you might live for 55 years with ALS, right? If you want to live. Uh, Stephen Hawking has gone on record as saying that he was glad that he stayed alive. I don't know if you've read or heard about his story. He's also gone on record that he would want the choice. He does want the choice um, <clears throat> to end his life if his condition becomes uh, insupportable. Uh, we might say a little bit more about Stephen Hawking later. Okay, I still haven't uh, uh, explained to you why uh, the, the name Five Ways of Network. Right? I don't know if I have a slide on it. Uh, I like this slide quite nicely because it has Derek's uh, picture on it. Uh, but Derek wrote a book, I think in the 90s, called Final Exit. The subtitle is uh, Various Methods of Self-Deliverance, or Methods of Self-Deliverance. Right? Uh, his term for ending your life or committing suicide uh, in that book is self-deliverance. Right? Uh, <clears throat> it's by far uh, the best-selling book in this area. Um, <clears throat> internationally, uh, uh, international bestseller on the, on the New York Times bestseller list, translated into I can't remember how many different languages. Right? Available in libraries throughout the United States. Uh, as I like to say, it's the smallest, least expensive, best book 
on methods of self-deliverance um, that you can get your hands on, and that's partly because it can be free. You can go down to the library, um, make copies of the relevant parts, and uh, use it to end your life. Right? <coughs> um, so he publishes it in the 90s. It becomes an international bestseller. And when Compassion Choices came into existence around 2005, everybody was in the same boat, right? Um, <clears throat> Caring Friends was going strong. The arm to uh, change the laws in various states was going strong. And everybody seemed to be happy, but it turned out people were not happy. On the board, uh, there were people who thought that uh, Caring Friends, actually working with people on a one-to-one -one basis and giving them information about how they can end their lives was not uh, a good thing for trying to change the law, right? If compassionate choices was known by people to support that type of organization, uh, people would get scared and they wouldn't want to vote in favor of an oriented style law, which is what compassionate choices uh, tries to Legalized. So, other members of the board uh, thought we can we can uh, coexist just fine. There's no problem, right? Uh, and both are necessary. We need to change the law, but in the meantime, we need to work with people who want to end their lives now, right? Uh, <clears throat> well, they lost. The people who thought we can coexist and get along, uh, we can be mutually beneficial. They lost. They were kicked off the board, right? <clears throat> um, and compassion choices went its own way. Those people who were kicked off wanted there to continue to be a caring friends type organization. Why they didn't continue calling it caring friends, I don't know. Derek, one of those people who was kicked off, I call them schismatics, right? Uh, said to them, why don't you use the title of my book in your organization? So that's what they did. They just thought, well, we can't call ourselves a final exit because we're an organization. We've got to call ourselves a net. Right? Final exit net. Right? <clears throat> and otherwise, they're exactly like Harry Craig. What Final Exit Network does then is provide information to people about how they can end their lives, and they're also active in trying to research uh, methods, effective methods that ordinary people can use to end their lives when they're suffering from irreversible uh, <coughs> lethal medical conditions. Let me say just one more thing, and then I want you to ask the questions or to make points that you feel like making. So I mentioned that in Oregon, uh, the Oregon style law is all about uh, getting doctors to prescribe a lethal medic, uh, lethal dose, overdose, usually barbiturates, right? <coughs> But you can't otherwise get your hands on them, right? So what if you don't live in a state like Oregon? What if you live in a state like Oregon and you're not uh, declared terminally ill under the criteria? What do you do then? Well, there's always guns, right? There's always jumping off a bridge. Uh, there's always hanging yourself, as the comedian, comedian did. Uh, I forget his name now. What was his name? Williams. Yeah, Robert Williams. Uh, tied a rope around his neck and killed himself. Well, there's all, all, all the, always those methods, right? Uh, but the folks in Caring Friends and the folks in Final like Exit Network uh, thought, well, there are various problems with those methods, right? Take using a gun and shooting yourself through the head or through the heart or something. It's very bloody. It's very messy, right? Uh, your body's going to be found by somebody, right? Do you really want your best friend or your wife or your husband to find a bloody mess? Right? No, most of us don't. Right? Um, really, hanging yourself, is that really pleasant for a loved one to find? No. Most of us agree that some of these methods um, might be effective, but the effects on others are detrimental. So Caring Friends Final Exit Network wanted to come up with a method that was relatively non-gruesome. Right? Uh, that was fast, that was quick, that was effective. So they did research. And they continue to do research. We continue to do research. But the research that they did back in the early 2000s resulted in what's called the 
helium method. Uh, we can talk a bit about the helium method at some point if you'd like to. Um, you may or may not have heard of it. We have now migrated to the nitrogen method, right? Uh, and we can talk about that. <coughs> Basically, uh, you get a can of helium, a can of nitrogen, right? Um, you rig up a bag that you can pull down over your head with the tube from the nitrogen into your um, bag, you turn on the tube, and you breathe pure helium or pure nitrogen, and you go unconscious in about 30 seconds, and you die in about five minutes. Right. Um, <coughs> it's one of the fastest, most painless, least gruesome methods that we have invented that is available to pretty much anybody. Pretty much anybody doesn't mean everybody. If you've ever bought a helium tank from a balloon store, a party store, you know that in order to get the helium going, you have to turn a valve, right? Anybody done that? Yeah, got to turn a valve, right? Uh, <clears throat> if you're filling up balloons, there's a little device on the nipple that enables you to fill up the balloons. Well, you don't want that on there if you're going to fill up a bag that you're going to pull down over your head. So you've got to take that off. Right. Very simple for us to do, right? I'm sure anybody in this room could turn the valve and could take the nipple off. But a lot of people can't do that. If you're suffering from Parkinson's, you may not be able to do that. Right? Uh, if you've got MS, multiple sclerosis, you may not be able to do that. Right? So that method is not going to work for you. You with me? Right. Okay, so we developed, uh, they developed, Gary Friends, uh, Felix developed that method as, as the method that we teach people and that people use. Um, Fire Election Network, compassionate uh, pick caring friends, offers to be present with people when they end their lives. Right? <clears throat> uh, we send out people at no cost to them uh, to talk with them, to be with them, to offer them support uh, when they decide to end their lives. Right? First thing we say to them uh, on the day that they have chosen to end their lives is, do you really want to do this? What exactly are you going to do? And if they don't say, I'm going to end my life and I want to do it, we turn around and walk out. Okay? Fundamental libertarian principle. You control your fate, or you ought to. Right? We don't. You do. Okay? If you tell us to get out of here, we'll leave. Right? When they put the bag on their head, we ask them, do you know what's going to happen if you turn on that gas and you pull the bag down over your head? If they don't say, I know I will die, we say, you're not ready for this. Right? If they say, I know I will die, and then we ask them, do you want to die? And they say, yes. Then we say, okay, go ahead, turn on the valve, and then pull down the bag. Right? And we're with them. And we'll hold their hand if they want us to. Um, pat them on the back. They don't want us to do it. We won't do it. Right? It's up to them. <clears throat> so, we offer a support service then to people who wish to end their lives when they are suffering from irremediable conditions. It is not a panacea. It doesn't work for anybody who cannot manipulate the devices. Right? So it's not the ideal but it goes way beyond the Oregon law towards what we think the ideal is, which is a peaceful death, painless, quick, for anyone who wants it when they're suffering from irremediable lethal conditions. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. And we do it with the support of people who agree with us, and only with their support, right? Good libertarian organization. We get no government subsidy, although we are a 501c3, right? So if you donate to us, uh, you get the tax deduction. Right? You become a member, uh, you get the tax uh, right off because of it. There are membership forms in the brochure that I've given some people, and I hope everybody will pick up. 
All right, so that's intended to get the discussion going. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say uh, unprovoked. So questions, issues.
or find ways to network to go out of existence for the right reasons. Right? Um, we shouldn't have to exist. Right? Uh, but what's really interesting is that, well, first of all, let me ask you a question. What do you think is the most liberal state nation in the world with respect to this whole area of right to die? Netherlands. Yeah. Uh, Netherlands and Belgium um, are kind of neck and neck on this, right? Uh, the Netherlands and Belgium allow euthanasia. Big difference in the law between euthanasia and assisted suicide, right? Anybody know what the big difference in the law is? Wouldn't euthanasia be where the government could dictate that they would, you know, you're no longer like a useful citizen, so they can execute you? Well, that's what people fear, and euthanasia has gotten sort of a bad name because that's what the Nazis did, and they called it euthanasia. Well, you'd have to include progressives. Not just Nazis, because it was an accepted thought here in America at one point. Yeah, unfortunately it was. Right. And that's one reason why uh, organizations trying to change the law uh, often don't want to use the term euthanasia. Uh, I use the term euthanasia, especially in my courses, when, uh, but I always preface it by voluntary euthanasia. Right? What the Nazis practiced was involuntary euthanasia, right? Or non-voluntary. It's next between involuntary and non-voluntary. Non-voluntary euthanasia is when you kill somebody who is not competent. They don't know what you're doing, right? Uh, when you kill an animal, euthanize an animal, that's non-voluntary euthanasia because animals cannot consent. They don't know what you're doing. Uh, but humans, uh, for the most part, can know, but some cannot know, right? So if you're sufficiently mentally ill, if you're sufficiently uh, mentally challenged, may not be in a position to know that I'm going to kill you, right? And the Nazis thought it perfectly appropriate uh, to kill people who were not mentally competent. And they gave it a very bad name to euthanasia because of that, right? But in the Netherlands and in Belgium, uh, they practice voluntary euthanasia. So that's the practice where you can go to a doctor and if you're suffering from certain conditions and you're not able to end your own life, uh, then the, doc the doctor can hook you up and can inject you with a lethal overdose. Right? And that is done in the, ne in the Netherlands and in Belgium. That is not legal in any state in the United States. Right? And uh, one of the very interesting things is Compassionate Choices, which is one of the organizations pushing heavily for changing the law, does not advocate voluntary euthanasia. In fact, they're very firmly opposed to it <clears throat> because they think the public will see it as a slippery slope to something like what the Nazis did, right? Uh, whereas in Belgium and in the Netherlands, they do not see that as a problem. They see this as a humane development of their medical system, right? Right in line with what doctors should be doing. Other questions? Yes? You mentioned the public. What is the public perception of these types of laws in different regions of the country? So, uh, I think I have a slide on this. Uh, whether I can find it uh, right off the bat is another question. So, uh, things are kind of, you know, polls are. <clears throat> Frustrating, aren't they? Uh, and they do polls in California, they do polls in various places, and they find usually that 70% of the people polled favor Oregon style laws. Um, meaning, I guess, that if they were asked to vote, they would vote in favor of an Oregon style law. Again, the Oregon style law has these restrictions on terminality, and you have to get the prescription from the doctor and stuff like that. <clears throat> and if you were not uh, diagnosed with uh, six months or less than that, uh, Seventy percent or so of the public support those style of laws. I, I am not aware of polls that have been conducted on voluntary euthanasia, so I cannot speak to that. The problem with polls is that they did a poll back in the early 2000s in California as to what people thought, and something like 70 percent said yes, I'm in favor of it. But when it, when it actually came time to vote, 
the uh, measure was defeated. Right? And by a fairly substantial margin. So the problem here is who actually turns out the vote? Right? And the opposition often uh, turns out the vote much more heavily than the people who actually favor it. And, and uh, very often these laws fail. Yes. I would think the church would be uh, organizing. Yeah, well, one of the big opponents of organ style laws, euthanasia in general, is the Roman Catholic Church. And most uh, Protestants, not all, but most Protestant organizations are opposed. Uh, certainly, fundamentalist evangelicals like Christians tend to be opposed um, <coughs> to these types of laws. Um, but some people, some religious people, are not at all, and indeed, um, you have chaplains, people to uh, the right to die uh, in our latest newsletter. Other questions, issues? Yeah, Kyle. I just think it's so interesting that we talk about voluntary euthanasia, and, uh, and we actually do something in America that's very similar. It's called terminal sedation. And so you know, if someone is suffering and, and very ill and they're not going to relieve their pain, we will continue to give them morphine and, um, and benzos and uh, even drugs like propofol, which is what killed Michael Jackson, up until the point that those drugs kill them. But we say no, our intent was to relieve their suffering, not to kill them. And so we've actually euthanized them. But you said that that wasn't our intention. Uh, and it wasn't. I, I don't know, but, uh, it, but it's, it's like a word game. And, and if I say, well, I, you know, they, they were short of breath and they were in pain. And that's why I did it. That is okay. If I actually said it was to end their life, then that's not okay. Yeah, it's called the doctrine of double effect. It goes way back in history of Catholics <laughs> and uh, Jesuits, probably. It's a Jesuitical distinction, isn't it? Um, and it's not, it's not clear to me that it's a, um, um, a sound distinction, as I think you're suggesting. Um, you might ask the person, what's the moral difference between <clears throat> giving a person an overdose of uh, drugs knowing that it's going to end their life, but your intention is simply to relieve their pain, what's the difference between that and intending to end their life, knowing that it will relieve their pain? Right? Uh, I don't have an answer to a moral difference there. I know the law makes a big difference, and the law, by the way, makes a big difference, as I've already said, between voluntary euthanasia and assisted suicide. You guys, I'm sure, have heard of Jack Morgan. You hadn't heard of Derek Humphrey, but I'm sure everybody in here has heard of Jack Morgan. Um, he was eventually convicted of second degree murder. You probably know that. Uh, but he came to trial three times in the state of Michigan before he was ever convicted of second degree murder. And in each case, he was acquitted by a jury. Uh, why is that? It was very easy to convict him the second time on the second degree murder charges. I don't know if anybody saw the 60 Minutes video that uh, they broadcast. It showed him injecting a man who had ALS at the request of that man, and the man died. Well, the fact that he injected him was what the prosecutor used to convict him, and it was very speedy. But when, if the person had been hooked up so that he could turn on the flow, he would have been acquitted as he had been in all the other cases because his defense was he killed himself. I didn't kill him. But in the case of voluntary euthanasia, they said, well, you injected him, so you killed him. Very subtle distinction, right? And I don't think it makes a moral difference, provided we know that the man wanted him to inject him. Well, you really can't do these things in hospitals either. In hospitals, have a lot of ability issues, and they also have now, especially with uh, if you have a you know, financial incentive not to kill people because they're bringing big money. That's right. My mother was in a, a nursing home in Louisiana after Katrina. Good point. That did that had empty beds. I mean, if someone died, they would have been lost for ten to twelve thousand dollars. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the medical system is kind of rigged against the people who might want to in their suffering um, before nature would otherwise in their suffering. So, that, yeah, go ahead. Um, this is a little different, but my question is, uh, if somebody commits suicide, will they um, be eligible for Social Security benefits? You know, the family. 
If I commit suicide, would my wife be eligible for benefits? I can't speak to Social Security. Uh, I know that insurance policies, uh, people are eligible for their insurance policies even if they end their lives. Most insurance policies have a one-year waiting period. Some have a two-year waiting period, but none have longer. I believe Social Security. I don't know about Social Security. You're a murderer, but the death is still because it's, it's something that you paid into. Whereas insurance policies have kept it. So, Finalizer Network is the only organization that uh, offers this sort of uh, support and education, and that offers to be with people when they actually make their lives. Passion Choices does not do that. In fact, they are very leery of doing that because they think that jeopardize their attempt to change the law. That's a difference uh, of opinion on tactics here, right? I think the law should be changed also, and I support compassionate choices attempt to change the law, right? It bothers me that uh, they oppose attempts to change the law to a better law than the Oregon style law, to a law that would enable people uh, suffering from various types of legal conditions to receive voluntary uh, euthanasia. That's the direction we need to go in. I think we need to emulate the Dutch and the Belgians. Um, but nevertheless, I support them. I'm not schismatic. Right? I want there to be a big church, right? big tent. Uh, it strikes me that the Libertarian Party has, has some similar issues. Right? Um, the Libertarian Party has lots of people who don't see eye to eye on all the issues. Right? Uh, they have this common uh, belief in freedom and individual liberty and legalized freedom and all that stuff, but they're going to differ on various types of issues, right? And the problem they have, and the problem that all parties have, is trying to stay together on the things you agree with, while at the same time finding a way to disagree and maybe eventually come to agreement on what you disagree about, right? Um, these are common problems. So, do that to mean you're not a member of the party? I'm sorry? You're not a member of the Libertarian Party. I am a member of the Libertarian Party. Oh, yeah. okay. It didn't sound like that. Yeah. No, I, I'm, not, I'm a member from California. Yeah. I've been a member for uh, actually a very long time, yeah. Are you familiar with uh, Diane Reed and her story about her husband? This was in North Carolina where they didn't have the right to die law, and uh, he had to starve himself to die. And it was uh, medically super supervised, but that was the only way they could do it. Right. It was too late for him to move to Oregon. Yeah, right. Uh, that's that, that the acronym is VRFF, actually. Uh, yeah, VR, uh, voluntary refusal of food and uh, nutrition. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, this is a uh, method that we will tell people about, uh, but it's not a method that we support uh, per se because to support it properly requires two or three weeks of intensive care of the person undergoing it. It's a very slow method of death, and unless it's properly supervised by really a nurse or a medical professional, uh, it's not painless. And it's also not fun for the family members. Uh, the good thing about the helium method um, is that it's very quick, and there's no pain, and the person goes unconscious almost instantaneously. I've been at some of these deaths, and it's unbelievable how fast uh, it works. <coughs> um, so, and many, many times family members are there, and the grief is that they are dying, but it's not that they're suffering. Indeed, they know they're not suffering. So there's relief at that, right? Um, but obviously, there's going to be grief that your loved one is gone. Right? Um, that whole area is a very, very interesting area, and it's one of the reasons why it's uh, really interesting to work with Finalizer Networks in what we call our guide program. Uh, because if you become a guide, as I am, uh, you actually get to know people who want to end their lives, and you become their friend, and you sit with them, what they actually do, with and with their family members, right? And I've had family members hug me, and cry, and, um, and be so happy that I was there, and that I was a source of support. It's pretty amazing, yeah.
Uh, I guess just hearing you talk brought up a personal story. My grandmother died uh, maybe two years ago. And uh, of course, we couldn't, we didn't do any of the uh, uh, voluntary uh, stuff here. But I remember thinking about it back then, just seeing her in pain, trying to breathe and being terminal. I went to visit her because we knew it was going to be the end soon. And just the pain she was in, it's really emotional seeing things like that. And it's just, you're talking about this, it brings it back up again. And I thought, I wish there was something like this where we could help her instead of just letting her, we let her start to death. I mean, being in pain the entire time, she's doing her up with more pain. Yeah. And that's all you can do for the most part. Yeah, and the unfortunate thing is that, uh, you know, so few people know about our organization. That's one reason I'm here. You guys are trying to get better known. Uh, it's, we're kind of in a catch-22 because the better known we get, the more prosecutors know about us, right? The more prosecutors know about us, uh, the, the higher the risk is that they might go after us. Uh, we think highly misguidedly and wasting taxpayers' money more than is normal, right? Um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, some, some want to do it. But on the other hand, uh, we're compassionate people. We want people who are suffering and dying to know about us so that they don't suffer in pain for months uh, and then die a horrible death, right? Um, we consider ourselves to be liberators, right? Uh, angels of mercy, right? Um, our two fundamental principles are compassion for suffering. Uh, 
of the appropriate medicine, right? I've asked my doctor, she said yes, he was willing to do that. Um, <coughs> he's a Unitarian, a Unitarian. If you find a Unitarian doctor, they'll probably be willing to help you out, right? Unitarians are one of the uh, few religious organizations that have gone on record as supporting the right to die, right? Um, and he said yes, uh, I will prescribe uh, the medication if you wish to do that. Uh, I'm not sure I would use medication, by the way, that I can imagine the Gideon method is in some, in some ways preferable, right? It's faster, <coughs> uh, it's easier. Uh, and uh, some of the complications that you can face, you don't face when you use medication. <coughs> One more thing, I would recommend don't do a family member or somebody's emotional that we can get your power of attorney. I told my daughter that you are not going to do it. You know, first of all, I don't want to put that guilt on you. And secondly, I want my wishes on you. And that's how I kept my couch. It's an excellent point. My wife is a very strong person, a very strong little person, and she's going to be my power of attorney. You're absolutely right. I, my, my wife is more of a bulldog about these kinds of matters than I am or anybody I've ever seen, right? She's not going to back down. <coughs> and they probably won't make progress in resuscitating me if she's on the call. If I may add a couple of things, I have a physician. I, I get into these situations all the time. I had powers of attorney come in, change things, and, and override patients' wishes with the right ventilator and stuff all the time. So the best thing you can do to protect yourself is make sure your family really knows what you want. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, also, most states have something called physician orders for life sustaining treatment, pulse forms. And this is actually uh, the only way I know of, at least in, in my home state of Hawaii, that you can actually order the paramedics not to uh, resuscitate you. Oh, and it's a form that you fill out, you sign it, and then your physician signs it. And you keep that on your fridge, if something happens in the you know, the, 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 the paramedics come, you show it to them. And, and if they still try to resuscitate you, you can sue them. They're not, not that point, they're not allowed to. So, that, that if you, so is that a state form? That yeah, but it's, it's, it actually exists in most states. I mean, it's either Pulse or it's called Five Wishes. Okay. Same, same thing, and you can uh, get that and go over with your doctor. Okay. Uh, and that's probably the best. That's very good. That's yeah, very good. Uh, I should mention that. So, uh, in summary here, I hope you'll become a member of Final Legend Network now that you know about us. Uh, I hope we'll tell others about us. Um, you can start a local chapter, and I can tell you how to do that. I hope you'll give us money. There's a envelope in the uh, newsletter there that you can uh, send us a check in. And then uh, there are volunteer opportunities for Final Legend Network. <clears throat> for example, I'm on the board of directors, and I was the president. I'm now the past president. Uh, the president, the new president, has taken over, but we don't have a vice president. So, if you were interested, you could apply to become a board member and become vice president of Five Ways and Network. How would that look on your resume? Okay. Huh? <laughs> so, think about it, right? I'm glad you came. I hope you got something out of it. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, much better to do a seminar than to have somebody drone on up here, I think. We still have whole time. Any other questions or Comments or yeah, I'll do that. Um, when a body dies, are there any surprises like those through all the uh, sphincters released? What happens when those? Yeah, no, you know that's a really uh, good point about this development of a humane, painless, peaceful, quick way to die. One of the problems with uh, hanging yourself is that people often uh, urinate or defecate. Uh, when, when they do this, right? You hear all these stories about people being hung way back in the good old days, right, or the bad old days, and you know, it was a messy business, partly because of the application of the urination. Uh, so the people who developed the helium method were concerned about this. In fact, they have a whole list of criteria that they want to meet, and one is that. They want it to be not unpleasant, insofar as it can be, for the people who might be observing. And so the helium method, uh, the nitrogen method now, same thing. It doesn't have any of these unintended ill effects. Right? The worst I've ever seen is a person who regurgitated a little bit. Uh, and that was very unexpected and very unusual. Right? And I mentioned to a doctor who was in a development of this, and he said, yeah, I can see how that can happen, but it's very rare. Right? So there's just hardly anything unpleasant associated with it. Unless some people don't like the thought of putting a bag on 
uh, they, they worry that they will uh, uh, experience suffocation. That's one thing they worry about, right? If you ever put a bag over your head and left it there for a while, you do start uh, feeling like you're drowning. Right? That apparently is caused by the buildup of carbon dioxide. And the great thing about the helium method and the nitrogen method is it dries out carbon dioxide that you exhale. So it's pure nitrogen, or practically <coughs> pure nitrogen, or pure helium that you're breathing. And pure helium and pure nitrogen is lethal. We don't realize it when we fill up balloons and when we suck in some helium, right? But our voice goes up because we're not in a confined space and we're not just breathing helium. Also, but if you were in there, yeah. Last point. Why not just a mask? Uh, leaks. Leaks. Any mask that's readily available for people uh, tends to leak. So, plastic bag with a uh, um, one of those uh, recall. No, it's a wristband, a wristband, headband around the car. Keeps it nice and tight. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah, one more case. Yeah, but then we're out of time. So, maybe spirit life is that I'm some sort of ill, maybe I have a mental problem or something like that. I end up in a nursing home where I have the ability to take my own place. And I definitely have the ability to take my own life. Yeah. And I'm just wondering is there anything that I can do today to, you know, or do to try to get the therapy that doesn't happen? Send me to the Netherlands and you can ask me if I can get that happen. I mean, I, I don't quite get that. That's just my biggest fear. It's not yeah. my Well, uh, it's, uh, it's a perfectly reasonable fear, and I think the simple answer to your question is no, there's nothing you can do. The best you can do is alert your family, your friends, to your wishes. Uh, try to make sure that they don't uh, let you get in such a state where you become mentally incompetent because we often don't realize we're becoming mentally incompetent when we are. So talk to them and say, look, if I start developing signs that would lead people to say, I'm not mentally incompetent anymore, let me know, and then I'm going to have decisions to make here. All right? I might make a decision, I'm going to end my life even though I'm pretty darn competent, but I'm becoming mentally incompetent. That's about the best you've got. We've worked with people who have Alzheimer's, and they're in the very early stages of Alzheimer's. They're still perfectly competent. They have their moments, right? And they decide to end their lives because they don't want to end up in the state that you're talking about, right? This is the first case that Kevorkian worked work with, by Janet Atkins. She had Alzheimer's, and she was perfectly competent when she ended her life, but that would not have continued. Okay, thanks very much. I enjoyed it. Glad you guys came.